It's time for the Hockey Writers Grind Line. A weekly show covering everything Detroit Red Wings. Brought to you by our own iconic top line of Wings writers. Sit back and enjoy the grind. Welcome to the Hockey Writers Grind Line. I am your interim host, Devin Little, filling in for Patrick Brown as he is on Coyote's duty for the night. As for my other line mate, I'll not. Per the rules of long-term getting married reserve, he has to spend a full two weeks uh, away from the show. So hopefully we'll be able to get him back uh, for next week's show. But don't worry, though, just like the Red Wings prospect pool, the hockey writers are very deep when it comes to Red Wings writers. And I'm happy to be joined today by the other half of our Red Wings crew. So first off, making his hockey writers grind line debut is the newest member of our writing team, Brian Oldani, how's it going, Brian? Hi, uh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me out. Um, should be a good time. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Uh, hopefully uh, you uh, make a good first impression. And then uh, from our newest writer to our most senior Red Wings writer, it is a privilege to welcome back the very first host of our show, Tony Wolak. Tony, it's a pleasure to have, have you back. How have you been? I've been well, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a while since I've been on the show, but I'm looking forward to today's episode. For sure, we're uh, like I said, we're happy to have you back. If anyone out you anyone out there uh, remembers Tony, be sure to give him a shout out in that comment section down there. Uh, and before we begin in earnest, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for, for tonight's show, the Hockey Writers Coverage Team for the 2022 Winter Olympics. They'll be bringing you three solid weeks of wall-to-wall coverage of both women's and men's Olympic of both the women's and men's uh, Olympic tournaments, roster and player analysis, game previews and recaps, commentary, and more. If you are watching Olympic hockey, you need to be following the hockey writers. You'll find a link down in the description below. And while you're down there, why don't you drop us a like and uh, give Brian and Tony a uh, shout out in the comments section. All right. Now that uh, our first bill is taken care of, let's start this show off with a oldie but a goodie. Uh, you have not been on this show until you've done this segment. One good, one bad. Uh, so this past week, uh, not the best week for the Red Wings. They lost to the Dallas Stars, the Nashville Predators, and the Chicago Blackhawks. But that doesn't mean there wasn't some good things to be had there. Uh, I know for me, I'll just keep it real quick. Uh, my good was that Iserman interview on TNT. Uh, first of all, just shout out to TNT in general. I really like their broadcast they've been bringing this season. Uh, I think ESPN's kind of been a little lackluster, uh, but TNT, I think uh, they're really going for what they've got going on with the NBA and trying to bring it to the NHL. And to bring uh, you know, the humanity out of Steve Iserman like they did, I think that was a, a real treat to watch. Now, as for my one bad, uh, Pat, you know, our regular host, uh, Brought this up in our uh, Red Wings Weekly article this week. Uh, Alex Nedeljkovic is starting to look a little overworked, uh, overworked, and I think that really, you know, showed up in that game against the Blackhawks. Uh, I think that going forward, um, you know, obviously Grice has been dealing with COVID, but I think it it would really help uh, help Ned out to get a uh, stable backup behind him. Uh, so, Brian, it's your first time on the show. I want to give you the first crack at this. What is your one good and one bad from the past week? So uh, I'll, I'll start it off with the good. Uh, kind of goes back slightly past last week, but the line changes that Blash Hill made to uh, take Bertuzzi off the second line and try to get some – or first line, try to get some secondary scoring going. I okay. actually wrote a piece. My first piece for the hockey writers was um, – I kind of criticized when Bertuzzi's out of the lineup, Larkin and Raymond don't perform as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just when Bertuzzi's on any line, the guy's a workhorse, a grinder. He goes and gets pucks, and he makes things happen. Fabri Suter and Bertuzzi have all had – have had two goals each in the last three games over this week. Um, and secondary scoring has, has, I mean, didn't really help the Wings this, this week as we lost all three games. But um, getting that second line going is big. So uh, that is good. And then my bad is kind of similar to yours, goaltending uh, in general. Grice has, has not been stable all season. Um, and I'm, I mean, I've been saying 
to friends and family that, I mean, if we can't have a stable backup goalie, Ned's going to get burnt out. And we're finally seeing his like first real stretch of games where he is just struggling. And he, I don't believe he's getting a start in Pittsburgh tonight. I think it's Pickard giving him a, some more rest. So uh, hopefully Grice can pick it up and maybe Ned can have a stable backup. Yeah, for sure. I think that uh, that's something to keep an eye on down the stretch here is uh, the workload that Nedeljkovic has to carry. Good stuff there, Brian. Tony, uh, what about you? What is your one good, one bad from this past week? Well, it's, it's sort of piggybacking off of what uh, Brian said, but I, I my good is that the Red Wings have two legit top line players. Even though they're on separate lines right now, but Dylan Lark and Tyler Bertuzzi, our mm-hmm. top line players and for a rebuilding team that's near the end of the rebuild, hopefully, I think that's, it's, it's huge for them. Um, you hope that they develop into top line players, to drivers, to game breakers, and they have. So that's, that's a great for the Red Wings. Um, mm-hmm. For my bad, I, <laughs> I wrote down Danny DeKaiser because he's had a rough <laughs> stretch lately, but seeing as how he scratched against Pittsburgh uh, on Friday night, um, I'm going to go with the NHL hiring machine gun Kelly to play at the all-star game. That is <laughs> awful. And he's just not going to be the kill shot they were looking for. <laughs> the kill shot. Good call. Good call. I was going to say, I remember when your boy Eminem lit him up like two years ago, whenever that was, let him up so bad that he decided to become a rock star. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kill shot. Good job, man. Good job. All right. Uh, pivoting to our next topic. Uh, you know, we've, we're, we're talking about how this past stretch for the Red Wings hasn't looked that good, but overall, and we've been saying it, saying this on the show for a while now, the season's looking up for the Red Wings. It's the most success that they've had in at least two years, definitely in, uh, during Steve Eisenman's tenure as general manager. Um, and Elliot Friedman, when they did the press conference introducing Nick Lidstrom as the new uh, VP of Hockey Ops, um, he asked him about uh, his timeline for the Red Wings and whether or not, you know, things were being accelerated because of this, uh, this year's success. And he gave his answer, but I want to know your answers, gentlemen. First and foremost, has this season changed your outlook of the Red Wings rebuild? And second, how long do you think it's going to be before the Red Wings are in the playoffs? Because let's be honest, they've taken steps. They, they were in the playoff race through December. So, Tony, I want to start with you on this one. Where, uh, where are you at with the Red Wings rebuild? Um, I wouldn't say it's changed my opinion. I was always anticipating 2023 being the year they return to the playoffs, and I, I still maintain that today. Um, at least I hope that's going to be the case. Uh, I think we're starting to see uh, some of their top pros- prospects like Lucas Raymond and Moritz Sider graduating and becoming, you know, valuable contributors on the team. So um, I, I mean, I could see Iserman getting a little more aggressive uh, when it comes to mm-hmm. signings and trades. We sort of saw that with the, the, the trade for Nick Letty and Alex and Alkovich as well this past off season um, and kind of looking at their depth chart a little bit, uh, especially with Jonathan Bergen performing so well in Grand Rapids, they're going to have a glut of forwards pretty soon. And I mean, this, uh, this is going to tee up a, a future question that for, from you, I know, but I can see them moving uh, a player or two out uh, just to like make room up front for their prospects that are arriving and maybe address the left side of their defense um, in the short term. So uh, overall, no change still thinking 2023 is the year. And then like uh, what Steve Eisenman said there. Good stuff, Tony. Good stuff. All right, Brian, you're up at bat now. Uh, has this season changed your outlook on the Red Wings rebuild? And when do you think the Red Wings will be making the playoffs next? Yeah, I mean, I was a little surprised with um, how well we're doing this year. But that helps when you bring in a goalie like Nadelkovich and you have two soon-to-be finalist Calder Cup. Uh, nominees possibly winning one if uh, Zegris wasn't getting so much style <laughs> points. But um, I mean, Eisenman's come out and said a few times that, you know, just because we're having success this season, he's not going to rush anything. Um, and I mean, I'd like to believe him. I'm Steve Eisenman. He built Tampa Bay. But yeah, it's been really exciting. And, and fans all over the place, you know, are probably thinking well, we want a playoff push this year. And no, that's not going to happen. Boston's got games on hand. Uh, and they're just up on us and we fell off. And I kind of expect 
down the stretch has to kind of fade away even more. Um, and I'm with Tony. I originally thought that next year would be the year we get into playoffs, especially if we're bringing up prospects. And like if Sider gets Edmondson on the line with him, that could be a lethal pairing. But um, I expect us to compete very hard for the for the wild card or even the third spot in our division next season. Um, so I'll I'll, con- I'll uh, agree with Tony that next year is when we're gonna be back in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I think from my part, uh, I think next year is very realistic. I think that um, they'll definitely be in it to the very end next year. I don't know that they will um, end up making it. I do think the Atlantic still looks to be uh, a very tough division. Kind of depends on what happens with Boston because they are kind of nearing the end of their window. I know for my part, I I see the Red Wings kind of still falling just a little bit short. There's still a lot of really good teams in that Metro division. But I think that, uh, like I said, they'll be in it to the very end. They won't, it won't be January. And we're talking about, you know, selling pieces off. And then I think that'll tee them up for a, uh, a real big uh, off season in 2023. And who knows, maybe they're going to have a real big off season this year too. So like you both said, it kind of depends on uh, that growth from within. So it's exciting times. Um, and to now pivot talking about moves that might happen in 2023 or this year or whatever, Let's talk about a move that hasn't happened, but everybody's talking about may happen or may not happen. Everyone has an opinion on this topic. Philip Zadina. We've talked about this a couple of times in the show now. So let's, uh, let's look at this from a certain angle. Let's pretend that you're Steve Eisenman and you have made the decision that you are going to trade Philip Zadina. If that's the case, do you want to trade him for picks and prospects, kind of like what they did with, uh, you know, Andreas Thanasiu and Gus Nyquist and all the other guys? Or do you want to see kind of a hockey trade, you know, a, a one-for-one type of deal, maybe your problem for my problem, you know? What, uh, what are you looking for if you do move Zadina? Brian, I'd like to start with you. Um, personally, I don't want to move Zadina. I mean, I think there's too much upside number six pick hasn't even played two full seasons. Um, There's a lot to like about his game. Guy takes so many shots. I don't know how he doesn't find the back of the net, but (laughs) um, if he does have to be traded, uh, I would want an NHL player, like ready player in return, like a, like a DeBrusque, maybe just kind of trade two scenery guys and try to spark their careers again. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, a one for one trade would be good, but I also think it would be interesting if, if, uh, we got him on that top line instead of Nemestikov and maybe spark him with some high talent players in Raymond and Larkin to maybe just, I mean, if he could get some confidence in a goal here or there, um, that could, that could really spark him and get him going for not only the rest of this season, but confidence going into the next season. You don't think that's actually a really good call out there, Brian. Uh, I know from my part, um, you know, we saw in the preseason, we saw Larkin and Zadina and uh, Raymond play a game or two together. And I thought for the most part, they looked lethal together. And I think that at this point, you know, from my perspective, I think we can all agree that Zadina, at least at this point, isn't the kind of guy who can, you know, lift up his teammates per se. He's not really a, a guy who carries his line, but Larkin and Raymond sure look like they can do that. And if you put us yeah, like you said, Brian, I don't see why you wouldn't put the guy who's struggling the most with the guys who are having the most success. I would even put, contemplate putting him up there with Bertuzzi, but that's a, uh, that's a conversation for another day, I guess. Uh, Tony, uh, I'd like to put you in the hot seat now. Uh, what kind of a deal would you seek out if you, uh, if you are just uh, being forced into trading Zadina? Uh, I would be grudgingly, uh, look for a hockey trade. Um, And I say begrudgingly just because I I think Phillips and Nita's stock is at the lowest it's ever been. Um, So I think trading him now would be, you get pennies on the dollar for what you would normally if he was hitting the net a little bit more. Um, But I think like what comes to mind with trading Zadina is you look at Sam Bennett thriving in Florida right now, the Panthers traded a, um, a former second round pick, uh, I think his, I believe his name's Emil Henneman, um, and, uh, and then another second round pick for Sam Bennett, who was kind of struggling in Calgary a little bit. Uh, he was fourth overall in 2014, so sort of the same same type of prospect of, as Zadina, but he plays center, not on the wing. Um, 
but again, someone struggling needs to change the scenery and he is just thriving in Florida. And I like, I'd hate to see that happen with Zadina giving up on him so early. So um, if I had to trade him, I would look for something more like a, a package deal for uh, Jacob Chikrin from our good friend, Pat Brown's Arizona Coyotes. It'll take more than Zadina <laughs> may take an additional first round pick down the road. Um, but that's what I'd be looking for. Not a one for one trade, not a trade for prospects, but uh, he, having him be a piece in a bigger trade. For sure. Uh, real quick for both of you. Uh, this was a question that was asked of us uh, two weeks ago, I believe now. And then even since then, uh, the athletic put out an article about this idea uh, just right on the spot. First initial reaction to it. Would you do a Philip Zadina for Eric Branstrom trade out in, out uh, in Ottawa? Tony, what do you think? No. <laughs> Brian, what do you think? No. <laughs> so that is uh that is three no's. So uh keep trying, Ottawa. Uh and, and for the record, I'm I'm in the boat too of you gotta hold on to Zadina. I it if if he was playing for any other team and he was going through his struggles right now, we'd all be talking about him as a player that we should target and bring him to Detroit and see if he can uh, find new life. I it's too soon to give up on a player that, like you said, Brian, hasn't even played two full seasons yet. All right, just uh, just a quick uh, pause here in the show. Just a quick reminder that uh, this week's show is being brought to you by the Hockey Writers 2022 Winter Olympics coverage. If you're going to be cheering on former Red Wings legends like Landon Ferraro, Justin Ablicator, and Franz Nielsen at the Olympics, you might as well be following along with our coverage at the Hockey Writers. So uh, be sure to check them out over at thehockeywriters.com. Thank you very much. All right. It is now a time to pivot to uh, our favorite section of the show, uh, Comment Corner. Of course, uh, we, we got some good interaction on last week's episode, so thank you to all of you out there who uh, dropped comments on that episode and you know for checking us out week after week. Uh, so our first question comes from our, our good friend of the show, Paradox Destroyer. Hi, Paradox. Doing my best pat impression there who uh, raises the question about whether or not the Red Wings might be building a team that is too skill heavy and maybe needs a little bit of sandpaper, maybe a little bit of size. He mentions Tom Wilson of the Washington Capitals as a player that uh, the Red Wings might need to uh, uh, potentially target in the future. Uh, for me, real quick, I just want to throw this out here and then I'll pass it off. Uh I think there's a potential that that could happen. I look at the Tampa Bay Lightning, you know, the team that he, uh, the Eisenman left. And what was kind of the missing piece that Julian Brisebois had to bring in before the Lightning could go back to back? He brought in Barclay Goodrow and he brought in Blake Coleman. Now, neither of those guys are Tom Wilson types of players, but they are grinders and third line guys that bring energy and can chip in on offense. Those were kind of the, uh, the sandpaper guys that were missing. And then, of course, they went back to back. So I think that... Uh, there's a possibility, but we are still way too soon into this rebuild to say that, yes, the Red Wings are, are missing sandpaper. Plus, Giovanni Smith's dropping the gloves every other night, so they have that at least for the time being. Brian, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you this question first. Do you think that the Red Wings need a little sandpaper now or in the future? Yeah, in the future, as you said, uh, Tampa Bay got it when they were trying to get over the hump of getting to those cups. We're just, we're just trying to, you know, be relevant. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's no reason to go out and try to get specific players, um, especially like sandpaper guys. But do I think we're a little too small? Yeah. I mean, when you watch that predators game, I mean, we got bullied all game, but just watching it, you're like, Oh my goodness, these guys are so big. So, uh, it's definitely it's definitely an issue. We could get big guys, but we have big guys coming up. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Wallander, and I mean, obviously, Cider is big, and he's only going to get yeah. bigger and stronger, and Edvinson. I mean, we got some big guys. And then, as you mentioned, Giovanni's dropping the mitts every other game. I mean, we got an enforcer <laughs> who's willing to throw yeah. the body around. Um, so I don't think it's an urgent need. I think it's something that we will get. But as of right now, we don't need to make a move at the deadline or maybe even this offseason. Yeah, it sounds about right. Good stuff, Brian. Good stuff. Tony, uh, passing it off to you now. What do you think of this, uh, this idea that the Red Wings may be lacking some sandpaper? Do they need to go out and potentially get a Tom Wilson type of player? 
it's funny you mentioned Tom Wilson. Uh, my best friends are all Washington Capitals fans. And if you ask them, it's like, you need to have Tom Wilson on the team. But <laughs> no, I, I think the Red Wings are fine. <laughs> they they have, I mean, right now they have Adam Rooney. They got Tyler Bertuzzi, yep. uh, Smith and Satter, as you guys had mentioned. And they have a few prospects in the system, even up front, uh, who, you know, can be sandpaper guys. Um I think even Michael Rasmussen could stand to be a, a little meaner on the ice. And if he is, then watch out. Cause I mean, if there's a mean dude who's six foot six coming at you, you're going to want to get rid of the puck. Um, but I no, I, I, I don't think it's absolutely necessary for them to have a, um, a Tom Wilson type, uh, especially with the NHL is sort of cracking down on the physicality a little bit and trying to get more to a skilled game. So um, not, not necessarily. Uh, I also want to point out, I had a lot of fun watching Tom Wilson play for the Plymouth Whalers in my hometown um, season tickets for 10 plus years. He was, he was Very a ride cool. to watch. Very cool. Tom, Tom Wilson is definitely one of those players that it, it's the cliche, but like if he was on your team, he would, you'd probably buy his Jersey. He's, he's definitely fun to watch, but you hate him when he's, uh, you know, he's pulling your guy's hair or whatever he's doing. But, uh, and, and the crazy thing, too, is he's kind of like that Brad Marchand type of player where, like, he's he's good at hockey. He's not just punch people in the head. He's he's good. Um, would love to see the Red Wings get a guy like that, but like you both have said, I don't think it's a necessity, at least at this point. All right. Uh, next question comes from another good friend of the show, Lord Venom. And he brings up uh, the fact that the Red Wings only have one shutout on the season. A couple weeks ago, Alton Delkovich got that shutout against uh, the Buffalo Sabres. And, you know, let's be honest, the Buffalo Sabres aren't exactly offensive juggernauts. Uh, but does that lack of shutouts this season kind of speak to an overall defensive issue with this team? Is it something to be concerned about? Uh, Tony, I want to get your thoughts on this question first. Do the Red Wings have, is, is, is the Red Wings lack of shutouts this season a cause for concern? I don't think so. I, I think it's more reflective on the on the defense around him. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, things are much better this season with Sider, Ronick, and Gustav Lindstrom down the right side. But if Danny DeKaiser is still playing top four minutes, um, Mark Stahl is still playing a heavy minutes as well. And even Nick Letty, like to round out the left side, hasn't been great apart from his mobility this season. It, it that's that's what's causing this issue with shutouts. So there's only one. Um, now that we said it, it's not going to happen in the Pittsburgh game tonight. So uh, it's in like, in addition to the, the, the defenseman, um, the team structure is still isn't perfect. You still have a lot of young players playing forward. There'd be missed assignments here and there. I don't think it's anything on the goalies. I think it's, I, I'm a goalie saying this too. So sorry about that, but um, I think it's just a, a young team, a not as talented team that is just growing. And as Edvinson and other prospects join the lineup and mature, and as Eiserman brings in stronger players, there will be more shutouts. For sure, for sure. Also, uh, to kind of go back to what we were talking about early on in the show, uh, it might help to get you know, a stable backup behind Ned that can also post shutouts. That would be, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, Brian, passing it over to you now. Uh, what do you think of this lack of shutouts that the Red Wings have? Uh, is it a cause for concern? Are you worried about it? Um, I mean, not really. Uh, you look at our defensive pairings and um, as Tony just said, we have a good right side uh, and the left side really struggles. And then you look at the contracts, it stalls expiring, the is expiring, Letty's expiring. It's going to make room for not only some more prospects who hopefully have like cider esque seasons uh, to come, but then also for Eisenman to go out and sign a defenseman that he wants here. And so, no, I don't think it's Nadelkovich's fault or even Grice's, even though he hasn't played too well down the season. Uh, I do think if it, if you're going to point fingers at anybody, it is the defense. Um, but I'm not too concerned with it. I would I would expect us to fill those gaps with good defense this offseason. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you do bring up a good point. Uh, you both have brought up a good point there about 
it's the left side, right? It's it's the Kaiser, it's Stahl, it's Letty who are kind of uh, uh, sinking the ship here. Um, and as was already said, they're all pending pending uh, free agents. So you know, even if you bring in Simon Edvinson next year, there's still two more holes that get to get have to be plugged. I know from my from my perspective, I'm really curious to see if the Red Wings or if Eisenman, uh actually goes out and pursues a uh, a big fish like a Hampus Limp- Lindholm from uh, Anaheim, um, because he's 27, 28, so he's in that range where you could give him a, a nice little deal and he'd still be around for a little bit. And the Red Wings do have holes that need to be fill- filled. I highly doubt that they're gonna just roll with three rookies um, next year on the left side to go along with their right side. So I think that that left side is where the improvement lies, but how they get there is going to be really intriguing to watch over the, uh, the coming months here. So yeah, stay tuned for that, I guess. I do want to point out real quick that um, in my eyes, at least, I don't know about uh, you two, but Kronik has been a disappointment this season. I feel like he's taken a step back um, defensively. That is, I don't know, offensively, he still gets shots and makes stuff happen, but defensively, I feel like he's taken a step back and I'd like him to get back to it at minimum where he was. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think at best you can, what you could say about him is that he's stagnated. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't think he's taken steps back. I do think him playing lower in the lineup now with cider kind of taking on the lion's share of minutes, I think has helped him. But like you said, he hasn't, you know, really jumped out. I think he has stagnated. What, what do you think of that, Tony? I'm pretty much on the same page as you, Devin. Uh, I, I think he's better suited for the second pair. And there are definitely some mental lapses from time to time. Um, I feel like he does he does sprawl out on the ice a little too much uh, to try to break up a pass. And um, I think he's he's fine for the second pair for right now. Uh, and he's, he's still really young, too. So there's plenty of time for him to uh, grow into a more well-rounded defenseman. All right. Now to end our show uh, this week, uh, we have uh, some business to take care of. Uh, We made a bet with our friends over at Blackhawks Banter uh, that the Red Wings would win uh, their Wednesday night game. And though they uh, they put up a fight, they uh, drew within one goal twice. Uh, they, uh, as you all know by now, they ultimately lost eight to five in a game that uh, every defenseman on the ice decided to not play in. Um, but alas, the bets, uh, according to our bet, we have to end the show by doing the shootout, which is how the Blackhawks banter uh, crew ends their shows. Now, what the shootout is, is kind of a lightning round type of deal. There's five rounds, five questions. Short answer type of deal. I only need one uh, one word or one sentence um, to answer the questions. Um, so we'll uh, we'll fly through this and uh, get the taste of that uh, loss out of our mouths. All right. Uh, starting round one of the shootout, excluding tonight's game against the Penguins, the Red, the Red Wings play Toronto, Anaheim, and Los Angeles before our next show. So six points are up for grabs. Of those six points, how many will the Red Wings get? Tony? Three. A win, a loss, and an overtime loss. Very good. Brian, what do you think? I think we catch a heater. Uh, two wins and an overtime loss. Five oh, points. Oh, oh, oh. I'm, the, I'm the pessimistic one here. I'm thinking two points. I don't know if it's a win or two overtime losses, but I'm, I'm thinking two points. All right. Round number two. Since uh, we don't have to, since we don't do this weekly, we can look at a uh, grand scheme things here. So my second round question is, who will lead the Red Wings in points at the season's end? Currently, Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi are tied for the team lead in points with 38 points. I don't know if that will influence your guys' answer. Brian, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, Dylan Larkin. Tony. He just scores. <laughs> uh, Dylan Larkin, he's going to start to look like the new Ryan O'Reilly by the end of the season. Oh boy, I love that prediction. Uh, I'm also going to say Larkin, and it's <laughs> unfortunately, I think it might be because of games that Bertuzzi has to miss. Uh, he might miss it just because of that. But yeah, I'm, I'm going Larkin as well. 
Question number three, round number three. Will Philip Zadina, we talked about him just a little bit ago, will he be a Red Wing to start the 2022-23 season? I'll start this one. Yes. Brian? Fingers crossed. Yes. Tony? Yes, and he's going to thrive. Yeah, that's that's a good answer. Round number four, looking ahead a little bit here, talking about players that might help Zadina come out of a slump. Uh, Jacob Vrana was on the ice recently, uh, just skating around, non-contact jersey, but he's out there. It's looking like he might be coming back uh, semi-soon. So when he does come back, I want to know, who do you think his line mates will be, at least on game one of him coming back? Tony? Game one will be Philip Zadina and Michael Rasmussen. Very good. Brian? Uh, I'm going to go more overall than game one, but Larkin and Raymond to get Nemestikov back on the third line to spark that line. Now, our last round of the shootout uh, comes from a viewer. Uh, Brandon Willis asks us, out of these three players, Philip Forsberg, Johnny Gaudreau, and Tomas Hurdle, who do you think Steve Eiserman is most likely to pursue in the free agency period, assuming that all three of them make it to free agency, of course? Brian, start with you. Uh, I know we already talked about us being a little too small, but I like uh, Johnny <laughs> Hockey. He's got silky soft hands, great speed, and the guy just puts up points. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tony, what do you think? Thomas Hurdle is a game changer and he's the perfect center for Zadina and Vrana. I, I do want to give a shout out to Philip Forsberg because I think Forsberg on the line with Lucas Raymond could, uh, could cause some magic. I would love to see it, but I'm with you, Tony. I think Hurdle is just too good to pass up. We talked, you enjoyed it as much as I did not enjoy hosting it, but yeah, uh, it was fun. what do you guys think? Uh, that's all. That's, that's our show for this week. Uh, that's another fun show on the books. I would like to thank Tony and Brian for joining me tonight and bearing with me as I shook off my, uh, my hosting cobwebs. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel on YouTube. It's right, right down there. You know, it's, it's, it's got a button that says subscribe. Uh, and be sure to check out our coverage of all things Olympics over at thehockeywriters.com, as I've been saying throughout this show. And, of course, be able to check out all the written Red Wings content over at thehockeywriters.com from myself, Tony, Brian, and our other colleagues at the site. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight and today, whenever you're tuning in. For Brian and Tony, this is Devin signing off. <laughs>